Hello and welcome to this review of my Mitsumi KPQ and KKR E99 keyboards. I've had these for years but now I'm finally going to cover these, and good thing too because they're kind of a vintage classic, they're somewhat common among second hand finds. I've shown it briefly in my Dome with Slider Mega review but it's high time these get a review of their own, especially because it's a pretty interesting and unusual switch design which is of course something I'm always looking out for. One of the two is in particularly clean condition, barely used if at all, while the other one is yellow to hell and very dirty, but ironically I like the dirty one much better. This is a KPQ model and the other one is a KKR, I'll explain in a bit what that means exactly. Both use a type of Mitsumi hybrid switch, which appears to be the successor of their full-size mechanical switches, which were quite good, and their miniature mechanical switches, which were pretty damn awful. These hybrid switches are kind of in between the two in terms of niceness of key feel, but arguably more interesting from a design perspective than either of them. The base operating mechanism is quite unconventional, it's basically a really fucked up dome with slider keyboard, although a more descriptive term would probably be conductive slider with buckling rubber sleeve or external coil spring. The magic part is the slider, which has a flexible conductive rubber foot attached to the bottom, as well as these rubber dampeners that silence the upstroke of the key press, so this is actually a dampened design too. They made several different versions as you can see. To meet the conductor fur, there is a single membrane sheet with traces printed on top. Now, as you can see, the traces are disconnected, and the point of the conductor fur is to bridge the gap between the two, closing a circuit and registering a key press. These green things all over are insulated overprints, which act as jumpers. The membrane is backed by a steel backplate. This is how their KPQ model works. The KKR one uses a PCB instead of a membrane and it has no backing plate, which is why it's about 100 grams lighter than the KPQ model at 880 grams including cable rather than 980, although I've seen Mitsumi PCB models with a backplate too. It's also got a slightly different shape to the case. Now being a membrane or PCB model is what gives it the second letter in its model name. P models are membrane, K ones are PCB backed. The operating mechanism of these Mitsumi hybrid switches is fundamentally different from a standard rubber dome keyboard in three ways. First, in these traditional systems, there are three membrane sheets. The top and bottom ones have traces printed on them, and the one in the middle acts as a spacer. Pressing on a key simply pushes the top membrane through the middle one and onto the bottom sheet, which is how it closes a circuit. This uses either a single membrane only or a PCB. Second, traditional rubber dome keyboards rely on pressure alone to push the sheets together. They don't require a conductor foot like this one does. And third, of course, they use a rubber dome sheet to provide return force and tactility. The Mitsumi switches don't have a rubber dome mat because the conductive assembly takes up all the space inside the switches, so there's simply no space for it. There are keyboards that use rubber domes with conductive pads on the bottom of them, by the way, but Mitsumi elected to use this different mechanism with a conductive slider instead. So to provide the return force, they used external elements, a coil spring for the linear variant and a buckling rubber sleeve for the tactile models, and that's what the third letter in the model name is for. R models are linear and Q ones are tactile. All four combinations of PCB slash membrane and linear slash tactile are possible, by the way. So you can have KPR, KKR, KPQ and KKQ keyboards. There were some more obscure variants as well, but these are the main four versions. I used to have a Commodore keyboard with the tactile version, which was a KKQ model, and although I no longer have it, I remember it was a lot better than this KPQ version. These ones feel mushy and clumsy, and the tactility is kind of lost in translation, so to speak, but according to my own mega review, the KKQ version in that Commodore keyboard was snappy and not spongy, and I gave it pretty decent marks. At the time, I attributed the difference to cleanliness, because the KPQ I had at the time was really dirty, but this new one I found later is super clean, so I don't think it's that, I think it's a model difference. 
The KKR version is a surprisingly smooth switch and really not bad to use. It does have a rather surprising trait though, and it wasn't until I saw the force curve that I understood what was happening here. It's not actually linear, but progressive, which means that it has a non-tactile force increase during the key travel. The result of this is that it feels more like typing on tiny trampolines. You never really bottom out, even if you really try hard. It's kind of jarring if you expect your switches to bottom out all the time, but if you learn not to hammer them down, it's actually a pretty good switch. I really didn't mind my time testing these, unlike the KPQ version. And that despite, like I said, it really not being a killing keyboard. The force curve I showed earlier comes from the data sheets, which Daniel Beardsmore from Desk Authority somehow managed to find. Quite extraordinary the things he sometimes manages to dig up. It shows some more interesting data as well, such as a projected 10 million cycle lifetime, a 45 gram operating force for the linear version, and a 50 gram tactile bump force for the tactile one, as well as a bizarre statistic called the click rate for the tactile switch, which is at 45% plus or minus 20 20%, which I have no idea what it is. Does that mean it clicks roughly half of the time? Well, whether it's supposed to be clicky or non-clicky tactile, that's a pretty poor statistic either way, I'd say. And no, the switches really aren't clicky. In fact, they're dampened, like I mentioned earlier. It's not very much a loud switch. It sounds a bit blocky, if anything. Quite interesting sound. They both come with straight cables with a 5-pin DIN connector on the end, quite old-fashioned considering this keyboard comes from 1995, and they have a useful feature where the cable loops several times at the back to stash it in place. In addition to making storage easier and doubling as a cable guide, this also allows you to wind off only as much cable as you need to reach the computer, so there's no superfluous length. Very elegant. The keycaps are pretty disappointing. They're thin pad printed ABS with Mitsumi's square mount, and I don't like the italic font they used on these keyboards either, personally. The KKR model used a much better looking standard font, in my opinion. Overall, I'd say stick to the PCB versions. Those are pretty decent and interesting switch designs. KPQ is kind of crappy, and I have no idea what KPR feels like because I've never owned one. Apparently, it's used on the Commodore Amiga 3000 keyboard. The KKR one is a switch you really ought to check out if you want linears but don't like bottoming out on your keyboard. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and following as a typing demonstration of me typing on both of these keyboards. Please note that I'm unavailable for the next two weeks, so there won't be any videos until late September.